Hi everybody, this is Solomon. I'm excited to be here today with Walter Hooper, who is not only C.S. Lewis's secretary, but also a good friend of J.R.R. Tolkien and an acquaintance of Pope John Paul II. Since C.S. Lewis's death in 1963, he's published several biographical reference books on Lewis, including the C.S. Lewis Companion and Guide, which is a great book. And he has also edited almost 25 books by C.S. Lewis, which I think is close to as many as C.S. Lewis actually published in his lifetime. So, Walter Hooper, folks, thank you so much for being with us, Mr. Hooper. I really appreciate it. So, Mr. Hooper, how were you first introduced to C.S. Lewis's books? I, um, I was in the Army, and, uh, but I had discovered one of the books, The uh, Miracles, right before I went into the army, and uh, this was 1953, and, uh, but uh, at this time, you know, the, the, uh, uh, the war was going on, I mean, a sort of a war, I mean, the, uh, 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 anyway, uh, I got permission just to stay out until I could get this book and uh, Miracles. And there were two ladies in a shop nearby and they promised to send me whatever books of C.S. Lewis I could find. I had read uh, only one other thing of Lewis's and that was uh, uh, Letters to Young Churches by J.B. Phillips, and his, uh, the introduction was by C.S. Lewis, and I loved that. I mean, it, it was simply unusual for me to find somebody was so certain of the faith. I would say now that that, that was the sort of certainty that I would imagine that St. Peter and St. Paul would have had. But anyway, I was uh, deeply impressed by that. And so I, I managed to get one book before I had to go into the uh, army. And I went to Fort Jackson, South Carolina. And um, most of my time was spent, you know, trying to read C.S. Lewis. But I, uh, Every time, you know, uh, I mean, during basic training, I mean, uh, uh, there were 10 minutes breaks and I uh, managed to just read one page of C.S. Lewis. You couldn't read it at night because they didn't allow you to sit down on the bed until up past 11, and then you just flaked out, right. you know, just so tired. And so, uh, well, I remember one sergeant seeing me, and he said, Honey, you, uh, fellow, you, you would be a wiser man if you uh, had a book on Korea, you know. And, uh, and learn Korean, you know, something like that. But uh, I was very, very keen on C.S. Lewis. And then when I managed to get through basic training, I then met a man who had met C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard of Bob Jones Jr. Yes. University. Yes. Well, I, I I I met Bob Jones Jr. and the the uh, chaplains were very keen for me to like him because they said um, he's a man who's met the hero of your life, and he said uh, so. You look after him and put him some questions, you mm -hmm. know. So anyway, uh, I was thrilled to death. And he was a very nice man to me. 
But I, I said, I understand that you've met C.S. Lewis. And he said, I have. And he said, I said, well, what was he like? And he said, I'm afraid. He drank ale. And um, he smoked a pipe. But I believe he is a Christian. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and but later, when I met C.S. Lewis, he remembered meeting Bob Jones Jr. <laughs> and uh, I said, uh, but he really liked your works. And and he said, but doesn't he know that the Greek word for grape juice and the Greek word for wine are different words? And I said, he may not know Greek. <laughs> and he said, but I thought you said that he was the head of a college. <laughs> oh, right. Well, for someone that proficient in, in yeah, Greek and yeah, yeah. so many languages, yeah. oh my goodness, he was... He was certainly one of the, I mean, with his friend Tolkien, yes. one of the smartest men in, yes. in languages and, and studies of words and yes. their etymologies. Yes. And very, very clever that way. So that's fascinating. So you came, you were introduced to C.S. Lewis through reading his book while you were training in the Korean War. Yes. That's amazing. Now, can you tell us the story of how you actually came to meet C.S. Lewis and and what, what he was like as a person, like what, what was his personality, was he? Well, uh, I had, um, there were some years, you know, between the army and um, I was teaching at the University of Kentucky and um, I had a chance to write a book about Lewis. Hmm. I'm glad I didn't write it. I mean, it would have been nonsense, but uh, because I mean, when I met him, all those questions just died away. And uh, anyway, I, he invited me over. I mean, we didn't know how many meetings there were to be. And I just would have been pleased if there were one meeting, mm -hmm. and I just saw him from a distance. But I, I, I admired him so much, but I didn't have to meet him. You know. uh, I mean, it would have been very nice, but I thought, if I could just see him. Mm -hmm. you know. Anyway, um, I was to see him on the 6th of June, uh, 1950. Six, six, 63 and on and so I, I was told that his house was very difficult to find and so I tried to find it and I couldn't find it at all so somebody sent me to uh, his housekeeper's house and um, in Kill Lane and she said, I know he's home now because I've just seen the car from Cambridge taking him home. Why don't you go on up? Was that Molly him. Miller? Was that his house? Molly Miller. Okay. And, and uh, so uh, I went up and, and knocked on the door or rang the bell. And then I regretted it. Oh my God. I, I saw myself as I really was and just. I was so ashamed, and there, but anyway, it was too late to escape, and there he was, and uh, the wonderful voice that he had, and he invited me in, it was four o'clock, it was time for tea, and um, he liked tea, and I liked tea, I didn't really drink coffee at that time, so, uh, but he liked it more than anybody I've ever seen. I mean, he, he, he prepared one part and then he went back into the kitchen and came out with a second part and then he came out with a, a third part and I thought I would float away. <laughs> and then so I finally said, I was bursting, 
I said, um, Professor Lewis, do you think I could uh, use the bathroom? And he said, certainly. And he took me into what was just a bathroom. I mean, it had a bathtub in it. That's all he had in it. And then he started getting out uh, soap and about four tablets of soap and about eight uh, towels. He said, do you think you'll have enough for your bath today? Eight towels and four tablets of soap? So I said, I'm certain I will. And he went back into the common room. And I wonder what to do, <laughs> but I, because I was I was filled with three uh, containers of tea, uh, so I finally went back and uh, and I said, Professor Lewis, it was not a bath I wanted. He said, I knew that, but that will cure you of those American euphemisms. <laughs> Now, let's start all over again. Where do you want to go? <laughs> <laughs> now, did he say it with a laugh? Did he, yes. Was he laughing oh, while yes, he was saying it? Yes, he was laughing, you know. And then, uh, but he, he, you know, he was amused by American euphemisms. You know, everybody uses them in, in America, but they don't here, mm -hmm. you know. But, uh, you know, uh, little boys' rooms, you know, little girls' rooms, and so on. I mean, we always call the lavatory anything other than what it is. You know? hmm. But anyway, pretty soon we were talking about other things. And I remember uh, he made a very clear distinction. He was always distinguishing one thing from another and he uh, I asked him which of your books do you think is best and he said I think p probably Perilandra is best now that is the second book in the space trilogy that's right, right yes and then uh, Perilandra after, after out of the silent planet and then he said to me, which is, which of the books uh, do you like best? And I said, well, I think I agree with you that Perilandra is best. He said, no, that was your question to me, but my question to you was, which do you think is best? See, you know, you might like one thing more, but you might find that one suits you best. Mm. And I said, oh, in that case, that hideous strength is the one I like best. He said, so do I. But you see, there's a big difference. What a sharp mind yeah, yeah. to make that the, yeah. the clarity. It kind of goes back to using words yes. in their proper context yes. and for their right uses, yes. that um, very linguistical mindset and philological mindset. Yes. Now, I'm sure you have a lot of memories of him um, past that first meeting, because didn't you see him a lot after that? Oh, yes. Uh, what happened was that I began to worry about, I would never see him again, I thought. And I really liked him. I remember as we walked up to the Ampleforth Arms, the pub, which is where the bus stop was, uh, I thought, I really love this man. Um, and I'm so sorry it's ending. But, you know, in the pub, we had a pint. And it just made it more gruesome, you know, because I liked him so much and I didn't want it to end. But then something uh, horrible happened. I mean, um, fairly horrible to him. Uh, the, the, the landlady said, uh, Professor Lewis, uh, 
I'm sorry to tell you uh, that your brother Warney was in here recently and he spent all the money he had on the bottle of whiskey and then he dropped it and broke it. And so uh, I put another bottle on your tab. Is that all right? And then as he paid, he said in a quiet voice, you could have waited. And then outside, he said, my brother is in, in Ireland. I knew nothing whatever about his brother. And, uh, but anyway, I was getting on the bus and I was sad. And I said, Professor Lewis, it's been wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. And he said, oh, you're not getting away. You're coming to the Inkling meetings on Monday, you know, uh, at, at the, the, the uh, Lamb and Flag, where you've been today. And uh, so I said, am I? <laughs> <laughs> so I was so pleased, you know. And so I went, uh, the next episode, I, I went to the Lamb and Flag, and where he was expecting me. So you said you met him on June sixth. Yes. Was that? Uh, do you remember what day of the week that was? Was it a Friday or I a think Saturday? It was Friday. Okay, so just a few days after. Yeah, now, yeah. now at that Inklings meeting, um, who were some of the Inklings at that time that were at that first meeting you were at? Well, um, John Walsh was one, and Christopher Tolkien was another mm -hmm. one, and. Uh, several, uh, and Roger Lanson Green was there. I was particularly uh, concerned about meeting Roger Lanson Green, and there were eight of us in all. I mean, one was Colin, uh, uh, the, the, uh, he was the uh, uh, Don at uh, Morden and the head of the Adaptive Society. So, so there were eight all told. But anyway, um, I started talking about how pleased I was that Roger Lanson Green, in his new book about the, the, uh, the, the, uh, the Knights of the Round Table, based on Mallory. Uh, he paid so much attention to Logress, the spiritual kingdom oh, okay. of, of, uh, of uh, the Orthuriad uh, knights. Logress. And Lewis got everybody to talk about Logress. He pitched the, it was like a ball. I mean, he just pitched it around, and he got people to talk. And uh, but he didn't, by any means, say all the things that. Uh, I mean, he said very, very little. You know, but he was a great man for pulling other people out. You know, mm. yeah. and you know when uh, Colin Hardy was the the uh, of the great scholar. And when we left, uh, Colin Hardy said, you know, after each of these sessions with Jack, I feel like my head is coming off, you know. He is so brilliant, you know. And then um, my was worries was, as Lewis came out, that, uh, that I might not see him again. And uh, I mean, I seem to be so worried about that. But uh, anyway, he, he, he bent down to, to give this, uh, this beggar some money. And I said the usual thing. I said, aren't you afraid he'll spend it on drink? Mm. And he said, if I kept it, I would. <laughs> oh, and he said, you're not getting away. You're oh, coming yeah. to the Inklings. I mean, you're coming to the, by the, the kills on Wednesday. And, and so then, just two days after? Yes. 
Now, what did he what did he invite you there for? He wanted me just to have tea with him, and uh, and um, he he um, he talked about writing and um, of destroying manuscripts, and uh, I said, "You mean you after you write something, you destroy it?" And he said, uh, "Yes." Uh, you know, what I do is I save a lot of paper by uh, turning one manuscript over on the other side, and then I write, save the, the land which of the war goes on that side. And then I said, then what happens to the two manuscripts? He said, I destroy them. And he destroy said, Destroy them? Like, do you mean, like, do you know if he would like? Throw them into a fire or just rip them up? Just rip them up, you know. Wow. Get rid of them. That's a shame. I know. But, but it was important that we establish that. Because I'm glad I asked the questions. Anyway, the next Sunday, he invited me out to go to the church with him and, um, and come back afterwards and had breakfast. Now was that Holy Trinity Church? Yes, okay. that was right. And, uh, and uh, he always sat in the same spot uh, in the church. And uh, I like sitting with him because I like watching him. And uh, anyway, the, the next Sunday we had gone through uh, the Inklings again and um, I've been out there on Wednesday, and then, but I found this Sunday he was ill, and um, and he said, uh, my hand is just getting so difficult. I mean, to write because I've got rheumatism in my hand. He said, uh, what I would like is for you to stay in Oxford as my secretary. Would you be willing to do that? And uh, and you said? Well, I first of all thought of my father, who was older than Lewis. And I said, uh, but I thought, no, no, I have to do this. And so I said, yes, I'd be happy to. And he said, well, you know, Warney may not like it because, uh, but anyway, uh, I hope he does like it because I want you to stay here and I want you to move into the, uh, the kills tonight. So Warren was his older brother, right? Yes. Now, did, did he help him with his correspondence? Well, he helped some, but right now, since 1947, He'd been going to uh, um, uh, Lady of Lourdes and uh, and uh, in a place in in Ireland, and he had been over there uh, uh, several times, you know, many many times, and uh, but he uh, he he. Uh, he ran over there to drink, and he had a great buddy who, who drank with him. And, uh, but anyway, they stayed in Our Lady of Lourdes Hospital. And, uh, and uh, so he, he might be gone for a long, long time, maybe six months at a time. You know? and, uh, and this was a sad thing. For Jack, uh, but um, but uh, but he knew that Warner he could not depend upon him, you know, and he needed somebody who could he could depend upon, you know, and he really did need help, you know, because he preferred. I mean, Warner had a typewriter, but he didn't really like. Uh, uh, type typing. He wanted 
every letter to be in handwriting. As most of them are. So how long were you his secretary for? About a year. Yeah. And, uh, and uh, but one, one of the things that I spent so much time in the hospital at that time, uh, uh, corresponding with uh, Owen Barfield, his lawyer, and um, one of the things I discovered uh, that interested me very, very much uh, is that uh, Jack Lewis, as he said, called him, uh, he, um, he uh, started uh, giving away the money that he made from the Screwtape Letters. And they appeared in, you know, in, in installments, one letter at a time. And he sent the, the editor uh, a letter saying, the money is to be given to uh, widows and orphans. And, uh, and then at the same time, he was working on the first series of mid Christianity talks. And he wrote to the BBC and said, all the money is to be given in installments to widows and orphans. And so he didn't keep any money at all. But then Owen Barfield discovered that he paid had to pay a lot of tax on that mm -hmm. money, though. And uh, so, first of all, I mean, uh, you know, it looks like <laughs> Lewis might have to go to jail or something, you know, because he spent all the money, you know, without keeping anything. And, uh, and so, uh, 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 Owen Barfield set up a uh, a fund which which he paid two thirds of his income into and uh, and I thought, my god he's he keeps almost nothing for himself, and you know I, I remember how poor and cheap things were in the kills mm -hmm. he had uh, uh, when Mrs. Miller went there in nineteen fifty two the black hat curtains were still up. You yeah. mean from World War Two? World War Two. <laughs> I mean, they were still up, and but he said, but she said, but can I change the curtains? I mean, the war has over, <laughs> been over for years, and he said, I don't see any point in changing <laughs> curtains. You know, it's just an extra expense. And she said, Do you mind if I wash them? And she said, no, that's all right. But then she washed them and they turned into ink and she just poured them out, you know. And, um, but, you know, he had almost no ashtrays, but he was, everybody smoked. And, uh, but he, he flicked his ashes across the rug and he would say at the same time, Ashes are good for rugs, but only men believe it. Oh. <laughs> so, you were his secretary for, what was it? Um, he, he was in the hospital. You, you, you said he was, you found him one day and he was, he was getting very sick. Yes. And he, he had to go to the, the hospital, is that yes. correct? So, how long was he in the hospital and then how long after after that did you stay with him? Yes, well, I, he stayed in the hospital for about two weeks and then I, I stayed with him after that. Now, did you return to the United States before he passed away? No, no, I, I did, but I had to retire and then come back. But he died the same um, hour that President Kennedy was killed, mm. and uh, so. But anyway, we uh, we planned to come back. 
I mean, that I would come back. But, you know, just when I was coming back, he died. You know? And so uh, I had uh, a great friend up here, Austin Farrer, who, who uh, was the warden of Keble College. And he said, I think it's so important that you come back. There's a work for you to do here. And he said, please come back. And uh, so when I came back, I stayed in Morden, I mean, Keeble College. And um, Warney welcomed me back. But he, uh, he was given the, uh, uh, he was given the royalties, and um, but he was always worried about money. You know. And then of, after he died, they passed to the to to the stepsons. So uh, I had had a little argument with C.S. Lewis at the end, and he was worried about what Warney would live on when he. Jack Lewis died. And I said, he will live on your royalties. And he said, well, you know, if, if, if there were any, but he said, you see, what happens uh, when a, a man dies, a writer dies, is that his, his, his books continue to sell for about four years, and then that's mm -hmm. the end of it. And then... Uh, uh, but, you know, uh, but I said, yours won't. And he said, why won't they? And he, I said, because they're so good. And people, your readers are not that stupid, so they'll keep on selling. Mm. And he said, well, uh, we'll see. And, uh, but then after he died, I said they will remain it. But then my first visit uh, to try to pull something out of this. Lincoln, um, it had to do with something I had heard from another publisher, is that two old books, which have gone out of print, help sell a new book. So my first port of call was uh, Lady Collins, who had already brought out uh, the um, all the paperbacks because his his uh, his books were selling mainly by with hardbacks, but she introduced the Fontana series. And she did a wonderful job. I mean, the first, I mean, uh, the first uh, paperbacks, and they were selling well, well, all because of her. Now, do you mean and Lady Collins of uh, Collins Publishing? Collins Publishers. Okay. So it was uh, Sir William Collins and Lady Collins. Okay. And uh, anyway, I, I was taken to see her. And uh, I couldn't believe uh, what glamour. I mean, every room, every chair in that room was covered in green velvet. And she had a, a chihuahua sitting on her lap. And she was smoking a Sobrani cigarette through a jade holder. And I was overwhelmed. But I covered enough to say what I wanted to say. Lady Collins, you can have the new book, but only on condition that you bring back two old books. Now what was this new book? Well, it was uh, the letters of C.S. Lewis to Arthur Greaves. And she said, very well, which old books do you want me to bring out? And I said, uh, First of all, the the the, uh, the uh, pimples regress, 
and then the abolition of man. And she said, very well, which one do you want first? And I said, the abolition of man. She said, very well, I'll pu publish that first, but you have to write the blurb on the back. And you mean the description for the book? Yes. Huh. And I see it's still there. Uh, but anyway, um, when the... Uh, when the, the women who work for uh, the literary agents heard about this and they, they knew I just almost fell in love with Lady Collins and they said, we, are, we know that we heard that you were charmed by Lady Collins, but we're not charmed because we're women and we can keep that charm at bay. But uh, don't you dare talk to her about money. I mean, you know, because, you know, if she said something like, do you want any royalties? You would say, because you were charmed by Lady Collins. Oh, no, you keep it all. <laughs> she said, don't, please don't say anything about money to Lady Collins. Just keep on being charmed. <laughs> but anyway, Lady Collins and I were very good friends, and uh, we had uh, wonderful years of working together, and she had ideas for books, I had ideas for books, and so together we kept bringing out all these books, you know. And that that were written by C.S. Lewis, but you edited them. Yes. And so we have yes. you to thank yes. for all those books. And I, yes. I think that's a remarkable accomplishment, especially considering that Lewis wasn't there to do it himself. And you took on that task. And yes. you, am I correct in saying that you dedicated your life work to that? That was your job, wasn't it? Yes, it was. Uh, um, this, this was my apostolate. And uh, uh, I thought, you know, what I want to do is, you know, Lewis had almost nothing of his own. I mean, he had two of the Narnian stories, and he had, you know, one or two of other books, but he didn't care about his, his own books. So what I would do is to go and look at the, uh, at the Bodleian and I thought everything in the world of, that he's written is in there. You mean the big library in Oxford University? The, yes, the, the big library because they, they have copies of everything that is published. And uh, so uh, what I would do, for instance, with the uh, the uh, the same uh, magazine that came out, you know, with the screw tape letters. Uh, I knew that there were other things in there that had belonged to C.S. Lewis. In the Guardian magazine. The Guardian magazine, and so what I would do is I would start at the, uh, the beginning, you know, when he became a Christian in about 1930 and then I would turn each page and when I found something it may be only two things per day but I spent at least eight hours a day uh, wow. turning pages and that's how I found so many things. Wow and and like I said earlier at the beginning I think the list you've edited, I think it goes up to almost 25 books now. Mm -hmm. And uh, you were also an advisor to the C.S. Lewis estate. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, of course, C of course, uh, in a large part because of your work, so many people who either who, who hadn't had access to C.S. Lewis's books because they were out of print now had access to, again, to books like The Abolition of Man yes, because yes. of your press. Mm -hmm to get them into print yes, again. Yes. And of course, fans of C.S. Lewis, including myself, always want more books, always yes. want to see more books yes. by him. And you fulfilled that by continually bringing more out. And 
Um, of course, another huge part of C.S. Lewis's legacy now is you helped so much in his literary legacy, mm -hmm. but of course in his in his cultural legacy now, the the recent Chronicles of Narnia films mm -hmm. by uh, Walton Media and Disney have of course brought his books to millions of of newcomers. Yes, yes. Um, did you have any part to play in the making of those films? No, no, no. That that really all goes back to our Douglas Gresham. He he was very interested in them. Uh, no, no. I I wrote uh, a lot on the uh, Chronicles of Narnia in that book, but uh, I haven't. No, I have nothing to do with the the uh, films. Do you think they have helped or hurt C.S. Lewis's legacy? Well, the first one, The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, helped, but the others have hurt you know, because they were not. They didn't stick with C.S. Lewis. What he wrote, I mean, like the. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't even recognize them. Uh, the, the, uh, some of them, you know, because they're so different from what Lewis wrote. I mean, why don't they be believe that if, if the Narnian Chronicles sell a million copies a year, why do you need to change it? Right, you know, yes. right. Isn't that, this, I think that's something similar to what pe uh, people said when um, yes. the Hobbit movies yes. were very different from yes. Tolkien's books. Yes. Um, and actually, speaking of Tolkien, you knew J.R. Tolkien, right? Yes, I did. Now, when did you first meet him? Well, I, I uh, wrote to him and uh, asked if, if I could come and see him um, uh, right in 1964. Uh, so after C.S. Um, Lewis' yes. death. And, uh, but he, he was very, very kind. And he, I think he was interested in meeting me because Jack Lewis liked me a bit. And uh, so uh, anyway, I spent half an hour with him. And as I was leaving, he said, I'm so sorry. Uh, I said, about what? He said, Jack's dead. And I said, but you knew him a lot longer than I did. And he said, yes, but I, I, I knew him for all those years. But you really loved him. And he said, um, it breaks my heart that you have lost him so soon after you discovered him. Um, he said, no, no, uh, I feel sorry for you Then I ever will for me. Yeah. Well, um, I think that, that goes to show the the, the great friendship yes. that they had. Did yes. he ever, besides that, did he ever talk to you about his friendship with C.S. Lewis? Oh yes, of course. I mean, you know, all that we ever talked about was mainly C.S. Lewis. Mm -hmm. and, and, um, and he didn't really like everything that Lewis wrote, but he didn't really like um, everything that was written about, uh, I mean, even himself. I mean, he, Lewis liked, you know, almost everything, but Tolkien didn't, you know. He was harder to please, you know, and, um, and he, he said, uh, I remember, this was a memorable phrase of his, Lewis was always being taken in by mm -hmm. somebody. Mm -hmm. He was first of all taken in by Mrs. Moore, and then uh, Charles Williams, whom he didn't really care for, the other inkling, and then uh, Joy Davidman. You know. mm -hmm. Well, I, it, it seems like even though there wasn't, as, as some people have tried to say, I, I don't see evidence for 
um, a rift in their friendship, like a point after oh, which no, they no. didn't see each other. Um, but it seems like they didn't see each other as often yes. in later years. Well, I mean, uh, the, the Tolkien family told me that, you know, you know after uh, Tolkien established, you know, I mean, the Inklings, you know, but, you know, he needed to spend some time at home. And his children were growing up. And they said, uh, you know, Daddy, really, we don't see him enough, you know. So they, they put that foot down and they wanted to see Professor Tolkien, you know. And I think he agreed with that. But, but they still saw one another on uh, every Tuesday, you know. Well, so you're saying one of the reasons that maybe they saw each other less is because he was trying to devote more time to his family. Well, yes, of course. Oh, wow. he, he needed to. Uh, be with his family, and the family demanded, you know. I mean, they wanted their father, you know. And and but you know, a whole uh, weekend, you know, or something like, or, or, or a night, uh, you know, with you know, spending it only with Lewis, and were not even seeing his family at all. That didn't suit them. And really, uh, Lewis understood that too. Now, J.R.R. Tolkien has had such an enormous impact, yes. just like C.S. Lewis in so many ways. Yes. And, and like with the Narnia films, yes. Peter Jackson's films have brought his books to millions of people. And of course, a huge audience for Tolkien, but especially Lewis, are of course Christians. Yes. Protestants and Catholics, and I know there was one Catholic in particular who really admired C.S. Lewis's works. So that was, of course, Pope John Paul II. Yes. Now, you actually met the Pope, right? Yeah, I did. And how did how did that come about? Well, uh, he he had been interested in Lewis's uh, Lewis's works for a long time, and uh, I know that George Weigel said that. He was reading with his students uh, uh, screw tape letters in 1950. Hmm. You know? But uh, he really was very, very impressed by the four loves. And he mentioned it in one of his talks in 1978, shortly after he was appointed Pope. Hmm. And so he wanted uh, to talk about that with me. And um, so uh, a young priest came up from Rome and he mentioned that uh, the Pope wants to see you. And I said, oh, I, I had no idea. I mean, he said, well, but can't you at least spare five minutes for the Pope? And I said, you know, I'll, I'll come whenever you, the Pope says. So you misunderstood what he meant. You thought yes. he was like kind of just trying to be nice to you. Yes, yes. Oh, I thought okay. he was just being nice. And, but he really was very serious. And so uh, I went there and stayed at his expense. Now when was this? What, do you know what year? 1984. Okay. And uh, in November 94. And uh, anyway, um, I met him, and um, he said, as I knelt and kissed his ring, do you still love your old friend, C.S. Lewis? And I said, yes, Holy Father, but Storge and Filia. And he said, oh, you knew I loved the four loves. You know? Oh, right, because those I are said, two of the Greek loves. Yes, yes. And he said, uh, uh, Oh, I said, of course I did. But he said, um, I see you brought a number of books here. I, I brought the first editions to him. And he said, do you plan, do you plan to read those while you were here in my house? Or are they for me? Lord. And I said, oh, but they're for you, Holy Father, Lord. So you brought in first editions of 
of Lewis's works? Yes, yes. Yeah, and how long, how long were you with him? How long was your audience with About him? an hour. He, he said uh, he wanted to know what Lewis was like. And, um, and, and one very kind thing, he said, uh, Ah, Volta Pupa, you are doing very good work. <laughs> In his he Polish it accent, so right. And, um, but then at the end, he knew I was wanting something, him to say something about Lewis. And he said, um, C.S. Lewis knew what his apostolate was. It's been a long pause. And he did it. Hmm. Because you, you can know what your apostolate is and not do it. Now by your apostolate do you mean, did he mean in a sense um, what God's mission was for him? What yes, he knew, yes, what yes. he was supposed to do? That's right. right. Yeah, I mean, that, that's a very Catholic word, an apostolate. Uh, um, and yes, uh, he, he, he put his finger on it. He knew what his apostolate was, and he did it. Now, was the Pope as kind and generous a person as, as people say he was? Oh, yes. I mean, uh, I mean, he was so kind to me. Uh, uh, I, I really loved him very, very much. And, uh, and uh, that meant the world to me. To, to, uh, I mean, uh, for him to say something is so good about Lewis. I mean, I've never heard any compliments paid him that was so high as that. Wow. Mr. Uber, you've done amazing work and you've brought the story of C.S. Lewis and, and his books themselves to millions of people around the world. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time to be yes. with us today. But before I go, I'd like to ask one last question. Uh, looking back on your very productive life now, what do you most want people to remember about you? I want them to think about C.S. Lewis. And I, I'm, I'm very keen for them to remember what he's, what he's writing. You know, if I might borrow the, uh, some of the words of Tolkien, one time I gave him a copy of one of the books I had edited. It's called God in the Dark. You gave it to Tolkien? Yes. And he said, <laughs> uh, Jack Lewis is the only friend I've got who's published more since he died than when he was alive. And I said, I know what you mean. But the same will happen to you. Hmm. And he said, oh, no, it won't. <laughs> no, first of all, it won't. Because I, I don't have that much material. He didn't know how much <laughs> had gone down to. And he said, oh, Ben Christopher won't know what to do. Oh. <laughs> My God, I mean. Christopher has just finished the last book at the age of 95. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. it, 12 volumes of the history of Middle Earth, yes. the great tales. Yes. And, and he really believed that he didn't have enough material. No, he didn't think he did. Because he, every time I visited him, he said, I've got to get upstairs mm. and complete the, the Silmarillion. So he was, so he was, his whole point by saying that was in... Um, almost to praise you for for bringing out his books and for continuing Lewis's legacy. Yes, yes. And that's what. And um, do you feel that you've completed your mission in doing that? Yes, I have. You know. I've done everything that I can do. You know. I mean, uh, last year, before the uh, Lewis was honored in Westminster Abbey. I've managed to bring out the, the, his uh, his book reviews. The last thing I, I probably will bring out, but because it's all there is. You know. Right. 
Well, Mr. Hooper, I for one, and I know a lot of people who may, who may not even have heard of you, but because they've read books you have edited, have been impacted by you in ways that they may not even understand. I'm grateful, and I know so many others are grateful for your work, and thank you so much for joining us today. I've really enjoyed our time. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it. Me too. I, 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 I look forward to every chance I can talk about C.S. Lewis. Don't go just yet, everybody. It's time for the... Mr. Hooper, what is your favorite meal? Uh, steak and potatoes. What is your favorite movie? The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. <laughs> what is your favorite book? That Hideous Strength. By um, Lewis Carroll. <laughs> and who is your favorite person from history? Uh, it would have to be C.S. Lewis. Hmm. No one would have guessed that. <laughs> and then, Mr. Hooper, what is your favorite hobby? Uh, I'd like to go with my godson to Rome and Assisi. That, you know, if I'm in his company, I know I'm safe. And we like to, to go see Rome together. Who's your godson? My godson is Gregory Lipiat, and um, he's he's like my son, my grandson. Well, that's wonderful. Yes. Please give this video a thumbs up, click that subscribe button, and ring the notification bell to stay up to date with all of my videos. And until next time, go learn your history.